Voice Over Coffee Shop, episode number 59. Welcome to the Voice Over Coffee Shop, where we share our morning with some of the finest names in voiceover. And now, here's your host, voice actor Andrew Morrison. Hi there. My name is Andrew Morrison, and welcome to the VoiceOver Coffee Shop, where we start our day with some of the finest names in VoiceOver. If you'd like to get to know a little bit more about me, feel free to visit my website at andrewdmorrison.com. In this episode, we have a true down-to-earth blue-collar voiceover talent who really epitomizes the true heart of smooth southern sound, with clients ranging from Shell and T-Mobile to Topgolf and ESPN. Troy Holden has lent his authentic self to the stories of many of today's top brands. In this episode, we talk about finding work in odd places, the patience of direct marketing, podcasting, and riding the trails of Nashville. Hey, Troy, how are you doing today, man? Man, I am doing fantastic. How about you? I'm doing awesome. Good. So so how do you take your coffee in the morning? Well, I am a, uh, I don't know, my camera looks like my camera went out. I am a um, huge fan of this gigantic cup and I fill it up with two cups of coffee and I use um, Italian sweet cream sugar free and a pretty good dose of it and a couple of packs of equal and I'm good to go and I'll fill this thing up at least twice a day doesn't sound like a bad way to start the day oh, yeah man. no gotta have it. it it depends man some day some days i'll be like nah it's a one cup kind of day and some days it's a one pot kind of day so yeah exactly sometimes you need an afternoon pickup especially when pickups start coming in our email exactly now do you slow up on coffee as the weather warms up or does it stay the same no uh not necessarily it really depends on my workload so if yeah. i have a lot to voice then mm-hmm. I'll slow down. Um, if I yeah. have a lot of like administrative stuff, like I'm going to work on my website and work on my branding and work on this, and I've got a bunch of emails and some marketing to do, right. then like I'll drink a little bit more throughout the day. Makes sense. Yeah. Makes sense. So how did you get your start in, into this world of voiceover? Well, I accidentally walked into voiceover. Although if I go back to when I was a kid, mm-hmm. I had the, at the age of six or seven, I got one of those Panasonic, cassette recorders for Christmas. Yeah. Yeah. And I loved listening to the Atlanta Braves and it was Milo Hamilton and Ernie Johnson back in the day. And this is back in the early seventies. Okay. So I would take my tape recorder as a little kid and I would record play by play and I'd read the ads out of the newspaper. And as I grew up, all I could think about was being on the radio. Uh, I wanted to be a DJ. And uh, when I was a senior in high school, my dad took me down to Nashville, to the Nashville School of Broadcasting, and we walked through it and we came out and he said, there's no way I'm going to pay for you to go in there and and do what they're doing. You're going to college. I thought, well, I can learn to do this in college. And after the first year in mass comm, I quickly learned that you're not going to make any freaking money. You're going to starve to death. Right. So I got a business degree and I went off into that world. And here we are 30 some odd years later, after doing some other creative things like having a country music band, I was in gospel music for a while, and then of course working all that time and uh, the pandemic hit. And like a lot of people, I was looking for other things to do from home. I was, I was at home and they called me from work and they said, hey, we wanna make videos when people come back to work and instruct them what to do you know, stay six feet apart and only do this and only so many in the restroom. So we made the videos and they asked me to voice them. And after we got them done, they were, you know, they were pretty rough, but they were okay. And the lady in HR said, you know, you can make a living doing this. And I said, please show me how. (laughs) So that's how I got into it. I just started digging in from there and watching lots of different people and learning probably a lot of the wrong things and just jumped in with, you know, both feet and hit the ground running. And, uh, that was July. Well, actually May of 2020. And by July, 2020, I decided, well, I'm going to get on some of these free platforms. Mm -hmm. And I started doing that and started booking work pretty fast. I was surprised and my audio was terrible. I don't know how I booked anything, but every penny I made, I just reinvested and kept going and it kept getting better and better. And the jobs got better and the education got better. And that surely made it better. 
So, uh, so were you booking all of your work off pay to play sites or did you start like direct marketing right out the gate or were you using like some of those connections from, from other companies you would work no, with? No, it was, I was one of those people who got into some Facebook groups and I didn't know any better. So where do I go first? I go right to Fiverr and Upwork gotcha. and, and, uh, that was where I started. And I learned a lot because in the course of the first year, I did somewhere between two and 3,000 YouTube narrations. Wow. So I learned a lot Exhausting. about reading <laughs> and editing. Yes. Mm. And you're not making a ton of money at it, but mm. I was, like I said, I was able to reinvest that. I could build a booth. I was able to buy a better mic. I was able to go get coaching. And as I got coaching and learned how to get away from that, then I jumped on voices.com and started doing okay there. Then I later went to voice one, two, three, and then in the second year was able to pick up a couple of agents. So it gotcha. was, it was a grind and I didn't really start direct marketing until, uh, the middle of last year, which was halfway through my first year full time. That was when I, I really started the marketing hard because I realized you got to have all these spokes in the wheel and the, and the ones I had in the wheel were very vulnerable and I needed something more stable that I could control and manage. Um, you can't control the terms of service on some of these platforms. And if you accidentally say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing, right. you could be in a lot of trouble and get kicked off and there goes your stream. So, right. yeah, there's a lot of crazy things that can happen. And so you've built like a lot of direct, uh, like you've built a lot of clientele through utilizing those, um, those different platforms and through direct marketing. But like, mm -hmm. as of like this year, mm -hmm. where have most of your new clients been coming from? Have they been coming through the direct marketing approaches yes. you've been using or are they still yes. coming through agents or? It's it mainly direct marketing. Um, okay. I, 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 I'm very targeted with my marketing. A lot of people want to get thousands and thousands of emails out. Uh, they've got systems working and they're reaching out to everybody. I, I very specifically target the Southeast. I go after Tennessee, Kentucky, Alabama, Florida, Georgia, Mississippi, Texas, North and South Carolina, uh, Virginia, West Virginia, because my, my general accent, and if I try hard, I can neutralize somewhat, but I really have to try. But my general accent is more accepted in those areas. So if you're doing e-learning, for example, and you work for, let's say, one of these automotive companies here in the South, you don't really, as an employee, want to hear some guy with a very strong northern accent instructing you on what to do. Right. And so that was my take. I worked in those companies. I knew what people liked and didn't like. So I went after that and uh, that was a, a genre. Uh, same thing with automotive. You know, I'm, I'm not going to sell uh, Audis and Mercedes, uh, but Ford trucks and Chevy trucks. Yeah, that's, you know, so I'm going after Southern automotive dealers uh, at the tier three level to try to get that stuff. And as I focused on that type of marketing about November of last year, I started getting those leads started to happen for a couple of months, nothing happened. And I'm like, geez, this is a waste of time, yeah. but it's, it's something you got to be patient with. It's like a, a good soup. It's got to cook. Oh, you know? absolutely. No, I've been, um, I've, I've been doing like, I'll do uh, regular follow-ups and I have everybody in a spreadsheet and I'll send out my emails. But like, I had somebody come to me recently who they didn't open or at least answer a single email that I had sent them within the last two years. Mm -hmm. But then they came mm -hmm. back, they came to me and they emailed me from a different email. And we're like, Hey, I got your emails. That company didn't have a use for you, but now I'm with this company. There and you go. They do. Yeah. No, yeah. direct marketing. It, you could book today you could book who knows when right right and i've i've booked off uh, some platforms that people say i wouldn't waste my money on that platform there's not really that much there and and the main one that i got great work off of was backstage um really? yeah not a lot of people like it or use it it's been around forever but the voiceover jobs on there are odd sometimes they're far and few between but one of my best clients came off of there um and it's repeat. I mean, they actually sent me an email yesterday. Hey, you ready to do another spot? And I'm like, I can't wait, you know, cause I love doing their stuff. Um, and then the other thing I've, I've noticed with it is like you said, they don't re respond or reply, but then all of a sudden when they need you, they remember, Hey, 
you know, because right. I make sure I send some samples now and then, you know, here's a, here's a project I worked on for so-and-so and, you know, blah, 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 blah. And it's, it's kind of interesting. And here's a, you know, 10 second snippet mm -hmm. and they'll hear that. And it may apply to something they have coming up. So you just never know. You just gotta, you gotta throw it all out there and, and see what happens. Yeah. So what do you, with, with so many people flooding into the voiceover industry, I know your voice type fits something very niche, but like what other things mm -hmm. are you doing to stay competitive? Um, I do work with a dialect coach and we had worked on developing a, what we just call a Gen Am character. So instead of me being myself, I become a character and we named him Charles. That's my first name. And Charles will do some of the auditions that say neutral or, you know, Midwestern or whatever. Um, I do oddly book a lot of video game stuff, um, cool. um, trailers. Uh, I used to do several trailers and that tailed off, but here lately I've been doing a lot more, you know, character work and, and that mainly coming through voices.com. Um, which was a bit of a surprise. I love doing the acting and I love the, you know, the, the fun with all of that. I've booked, uh, animations, I've booked, um, uh, uh, some, uh, an animated uh, film producer out in California has had me in three different films that he's done where I was a lead character and he's a, a retired detective and he's got a blind dog mm -hmm. and he wanted that old gruff sounding voice, you know, and that's been right. stuff like that's fantastic. So I, I try not to, although I do have a niche voice, I try not to niche what I can do with it. Right. Don't pigeonhole and, yourself. Yeah. Right. Right. And, and it surprises me sometimes I narrate a, a space channel, I still have that one YouTube channel, but this guy pays great because they get millions of views mm -hmm. and uh, lots of subscribers. And I read that thing in a very quiet documentary voice and people comment on there all the time. Things like, I never knew somebody with a Southern accent could even pronounce all these words, you know? So, right. It's, it, and they, they say it's soothing to them. It's different, you know? Yeah. So where a lot of people say, well, I'm offended. He's got a Southern accent. I don't want to hear that. Some people say, Ooh, that's different. I like that. That's soothing. It's relaxing. So. I don't know. You, like you said, you can't pigeonhole yourself. You got to throw it out there and see what happens. And sometimes you'll be surprised. I mean, during the, during the Super Bowl, I landed a spot on a top golf commercial for ESPN. Fantastic. You know, how unlikely was that to happen for me, but they were looking for a quote, Pat Summerall sounding voice. Well, I never thought Pat Summerall had any Southern accent, you know, mm -hmm. the, the old football announcer. So I just did it as best I could. And sure enough, got the call. I was actually showing my hillbilly self. I was actually up at a veterinarian getting a horse worked on and they <laughs> sent me a text. Can you jump on a live in an hour? And I'm like, uh, <laughs> maybe two hours. Right. But, uh, you never know. You just never know. Yeah. So what led you want to, to want to create the VO life podcast? Ooh, well, I felt a little bit of inspiration from a couple of other people who had Facebook groups that had started their, their journey and kept it in their podcast. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, I could do that. And I actually did three episodes that never aired called the voiceover rookie. Okay. And, and that was my thought at first is I'll just talk about what I'm doing and where I'm going. And by the third episode, I thought I got nothing else to talk about because that's as far as I'd gone. And I said, how do I do this? So I ended up partnering up with a guy and we did, uh, we started out with uh, the voiceover ladder mm -hmm. and we did about 20 episodes and then we kind of parted ways and we're doing our own thing. And so I changed the name to the VO life and it started out just following what I was doing. It was giving opinions and I knew it would change, mm -hmm. you know, my opinion on a professional demo in episode 25 or whatever episode it was totally different from what it is now because right. I've learned. And that's the thing that people can go back and listen through that journey and hear, boy, he sure was stupid in those episodes, but he learned a little bit by episode 40 and then by episode 70, he kind of knows what he's doing. Yeah. So now it's just more of, you know, interviews, um, editorials. I like to call them, I guess, because, you know, the one that came out last week was a big editorial and, uh, working on one now for 
BO Mental Health, you know, kind of an editorial on that because we yeah. all fight a lot of demons mm -hmm. uh, every week and every day. And we're seeing some things going on right now, you know, with other people. And uh, man, it's just crazy. But it, it's, and it's fun. It's an outlet. I think part of it too is that radio thing I always wanted to do. Yeah. So here's a podcast. It's almost like that. And I get to get on there and have fun and do the intros and outros and put silly stuff in there. So it's, it's all your content. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's fun. It's a lot of fun. So did that, did the podcast come first or did you doing the, um, the VO life peer advice and those workshops, which one of those two came first? The podcast was absolutely first. Um, I didn't start the group up until about a year after I started the podcast and the group stayed really small for a while, a couple hundred people. Mm -hmm. And then halfway through last year, it really exploded. I think we're up to about 16, 1800 now. Um, so it's, yeah. And it's not a, it's not one of those groups where you see tons and tons of activity, right. but I think people kind of watch for the post and see there's a lot of sharing that goes on in there. So it's, it's, uh, it's kind of quiet and I kind of like that. We don't have a lot of drama and a lot of back and forth in there. So. Yeah. And you very, you're very specific on, I'm not a coach. I don't do coaching. This is peer right. to peer advice. Now I'm really curious. What is the, one of the most like asked questions you get from, from other peers that are like new in the industry and trying to come to you for advice? Um, it's, it's a little bit of a mix of where do I start? What platform? And then it becomes, how do I put more spokes in my wheel? You know, the people are seeing now, I post a lot about direct marketing and how it works. I'm, I'm doing a, a little webinar next week, you know, for 10 bucks, they can come for 30 minutes and I go through the process of how I do it without a CRM, without a lot of expense, how to get yeah. started, how to target, you know, a couple of hundred leads and get started. Mm -hmm. And I, now that's becoming a lot because we're seeing, I think a huge shift in that to where there's a ton of people wanting to know about marketing and direct right. marketing. And it's a big subject. And, you know, we have some gurus in the business that have been doing it a long time. And I tell people, go to them if you want a, a, a set program, but if you're new and you just want to test it and try it, you know, I'll share what I can share with people so they can try it. I'm not, I don't do that kind of stuff to make money. I do it more to share, but it gets to a point to where if you're getting asked so many questions and right. you're getting bombarded so much, then you have At to some point organize it's an expense, it. right? Yeah. You got to organize yeah. it because I, I even did a podcast a while back on that saying, you know, be, be cordial with people. It, it, it's not just me, but you know, I can imagine what the, you know, the Bill Deweese is and the, uh, the, the guys that are coaches that are out there, Brad Highland and all these people, I can imagine the messages they get, the private messages and people, if they right. happen to get their number and call them or text them, don't bother them at night. Don't bother them on the weekend. You right. know, they, they got families, they got lives. And, uh, so that's why I'm doing some of this stuff and trying to structure it during the week. And, and I tell people I'm available on Friday night and Saturday night because my wife works night shift. So I, I have a block of time in there. People can block and talk to me or whatever, even on the weekend, but, uh, we all got to be cordial of that. It's, it's tough. Yeah. It, it can, it can wear you out. I mean, it really can. So it, has there been anything that somebody has asked where you were, you didn't know about it and it, it kind of changed the way that you approached your business? Yes, absolutely. Um, and it had a lot to do with the realization one day that what if, you know, let's say voices.com or Fiverr or whoever, even when you're in early, if they could pull, if they pull the plug on you and you're gone mm -hmm. off their platform, that really made me realize that the direct marketing thing was so important. I just yeah. didn't see it for a while. Really, I didn't understand that was a good avenue. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you hear the certain groups of people saying it's all agents and it's union and it's this and it's that. And then there's another group that's a lot of pay to play. Mm -hmm. And then there's another group that's a mix of pay to play marketing, you know, this, that local marketing, whatever. Mm -hmm. And I kind of, decided, I think I'm going to fall into that bottom group because yeah, I've got some agents, but what's that going to get me a month, two, 3% of what I make, maybe, right. you know, and pay to play is going to get me what another 10, 15%. So 
you know, last the last couple of months, uh, March being a great example, 80% of my income was direct off direct marketing, direct business. Yeah. Um, now, and when I say direct business, that could be somebody that came off of voice one, two, three, who now right. doesn't buy from one, two, three, but right. it's still, it's a direct client. So my goal is to keep that somewhere between 50 and 75% a month. If I can, it's, it's, it's tough, but I'm watching all the other stuff go away. Um, two years ago, uh, well, in a period of 18 months, I did almost $30,000 of work on Upwork. Mm. That's, that's a decent amount of yeah. money. Mm -hmm. The last three months, goose egg, nothing. I don't do anything there anymore because I either move the clients off or mm -hmm. they found me because of my name being on my profile and they came to me and wanted to buy direct. So, you know, it's just, uh, I think that was the big turning point for me when I realized don't put all your eggs in one basket or even two baskets. You better have a lot of baskets because it can move around. And you said you're very focused in your direct marketing. How are you approaching people? You're not, you're not sending those big, um, like mass emails. Hi, do you need a voiceover artist? How are you, how are you approaching your direct marketing? I, I do some of that. Um, mm -hmm. If I see something or hear of something, you know, during the week, if I'm going through LinkedIn and see something or I see a post related to something, I may go dive into that and that becomes an individual email. But what I currently do is I send out a, a batch of quote unquote cold emails on, on the first of the month. Um, I send out anything that I consider warm, somebody that's replied or inquired or whatever that goes out also once a month, that's a different email. And, um, it, it's just kind of farming all that and trying to keep, you know, what's warm, what's cold, who dropped out, who unsubscribed, you right. know, and, uh, stuff like that. I do try to, to buy some list, but I'm very, um, pinpointed with that. I've got a guy that I use that supplies leads and I'm very descriptive of, I want these eight states and I'm looking for this job title, this job title, this job title, you know, and, and, and I will bulk email some of that. Mm -hmm. But what I'm trying to do is just say, Hey, my name's Troy. I'm a voice actor. Here's a sample or a link or blah, 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 or whatever. I don't think people, you know, a lot of people say you need to engage and get to know them and, and build a relationship. I think you do that after. And that's just, maybe that's my opinion. I want them just to have interest enough to open the link. And here's the thing. They either like you or they don't. Right. They hear your voice and they go, ooh, I like that. Or they hear it and they go, holy crap, no, not for us. Mm -hmm. A yes or a no is what I'm after. I'm not after making friends yet. Right. If I get a yes, then I want to know more about them, more about their company, more about what they're doing. And those emails become individual and more friendly. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, starting out like, like anything else, you're, you're fishing, you're dropping a lot of lines and just trying to get a bite. And uh, that's, that's how I play it right or wrong. Am I following the right rules? Probably not, but. I mean, I, I agree with you working. completely because if you continue, because I, I believe there's a, a good balance in between mm -hmm. the two because mm -hmm. you, you do need to, to make a relationship with a client. And when I say make relationships, I mean networking as a whole. So right. if I'm making a relationships prior to being a client of each other, then that's for my local chamber of commerce. That's mm -hmm. for around town. You know what I mean? But I don't right. want to make friends with a hundred people over email. If the point of me emailing them was to produce, was to provide a service. If right. I'm not of use to you, then I would like to go provide my service to someone else. And I, I right. want to be easy to work with. I'm, I don't want to know all your kids' names, but I, I do want to consider you at least colleagues and, and friendly colleagues and build that right. kind of relationship relationship with you. Right. Right. And I've been on the other side for so long, uh, after working in manufacturing for 30 some odd years, you know, I had vendors after me all the time mm -hmm. for guys that had forklifts, guys that sold hydraulic fluid, people that came right. in to maintenance, the buildings, heat and air people. And the ones that could solve my problem are the ones that I wanted to work with, right. you know, and then yeah, sure. We'd get to know them. They would come in and out of the building and say, how you doing? How's the kids? How's this and that? But it was, it was a different level of relationship, you right. know, but, but starting out, I just wanted to see what can you do for me? 
you know right you're not invited to my you, daughter's wedding exactly like, right yeah. exactly can yeah. you lower can you lower the cost can you make it better can you be here when i need you can you deliver what's the difference whether it's a voiceover heat and air your tire repair guy it's right. all the same solve my problem you know and that's what i'm trying to send in that email if you need this i can solve your problem but and, if you and don't, i think if that's you don't, what I think that's what fostering a business relationship is because people think of the term relationship and they, they, they look at it as a broad spectrum, but there mm -hmm. is a difference between a business relationship and a friend like relationship. Right. Right. Well, I agree. I agree. So, I agree. So it's been like three years since you kind of first dove into this. How has your day to day work life changed from when you first started full time in VO to today? I have gotten a lot more structured uh, since January of this year. The first year, it was a little willy-nilly. Mm -hmm. um, I was more worried about, am I going to make a living? You know, mm -hmm. because I left a, a good six-figure job. I walked in in October of 20, uh, 2020 and basically said, or I'm sorry, 2021, and basically said, um, in December, I'm going to retire. You know, I really wasn't old enough to retire, but I wanted to give some lead time. They could get somebody in or whatever. And it gave me time to hopefully save a little more money and be more prepared. But you still go into this blind in a way. Um, so it started out for me. I'm like, okay, uh, I, don't, I don't have any work today. What am I going to do? Right. So do I improve some things I have on the casting sites and upload more stuff? Do I work on more spots? And I did a lot of stuff just trying to guess at it. Um, continued to coach and do things and schedule. But really when I got into this year, I really started implementing what I call time blocks. I know I need somewhere between an hour to two hours early in the morning to audition because as you know, we got to get in quick. Mm -hmm. We got to get them in there. But we got to be good at what we get in there. And, right. and I've got to read through, is this a fit for me or no? Nah, let's go the next one and get all those in. So the first couple of the hours of the day, it's blocked. I have to do that because if I don't, I'm not going to get jobs. Right. Then it goes to, um, uh, it goes to the marketing and the work and what you need to get done in the other five or six hours. So then I'll try to block at least an hour for uh, I'm checking emails. If there's work in there to do, if there's quick stuff to record, short jobs, quick jobs, whatever, knock that out. Um, and, and then the rest of the day, it's more focused on if there's any longer term narrations to get done. I try to do those like between one and three um other jobs you know whatever during whatever time and i can move those blocks as needed what if i gotta yeah. go to the doctor what if my wife's got to do this or that and i mm -hmm. say well that's going to plug in at four to six tonight because i'm not going to be here right so when i started plugging time blocks i got more efficient i started finding i had more time i was getting things done and not stressing uh, first year was pretty stressful because you think you know i need to make x number of dollars a month if i can um, my wife works, she makes a good living. She's got the insurance. I don't worry about that stuff, but still I'm the man of the house. That's my right. job. You know, I need to be bringing that money in. Mm -hmm. So that first year was pretty scary, but, yeah. um, we did okay and, and got through and my routines got better. The oddest thing, I guess, over the whole part of it was in 2021, mm -hmm. I made more money on voices.com than I did in 2022. Although I was full-time in 2022 and auditioning faster and sooner, but in 2021, I think there were a lot less people on the platform. Yeah. Uh, they, they ran that, what was it? A $99 special or something. And it, yeah, uh, something like that. Yeah. yeah. It, I think it put a lot more people in the mix. Mm -hmm. And I do think that, you know, the people that are good, that see the stuff early and get it in early and they get heard and get chosen. Uh, even if there is 99 auditions, so, you yeah. know, it is what it is. But yeah, I think the organizing and time management has been my biggest impact for this year. Yeah, you and me both, man. So what do you do outside of VO? Who is Troy? What do you enjoy Ooh. doing other than taking your horse to the vet? Well, we, we, have, uh, we have 11 horses on the farm. Unfortunately, we had 12 and lost one back in February. Mm -hmm. um, 
11 horses. There's uh, three dogs here, five cats. We've got about 16 acres. So uh, spring and summer, you're really busy because it's keeping fence rows clean, keeping fields cut. Um, we feed horses every day, uh, feeding supplements and stuff. They, they come up to the barn every day and we let them in and feed them. We love to go trail ride. We didn't do as much of that last year with all the stresses of starting a business and my wife changing shifts and adjusting to, to working nights on the weekend and being home during the week. But uh, our plan this spring and summer is to, to several times get out and get on the trails and ride. Um, we're not very far from Gatlinburg, a few hours away. We love to go up there in the fall and watch the leaves change and hang out up there for a week and things like that. And, and uh, um, her daughter and my son have moved back in. So uh, we've got the luxury of went from empty house to full house again. So we're trying to help them get on their feet and get everything going. So, uh, yeah, in between that and voiceover and, and, uh, doing my local marketing and stuff here with the chamber, I've got a podcast with them as well here. That's finally starting to pay off. That's another little marketing ploy I tried and it's yeah. it just, just started to pay off. I actually landed a, uh, a hospital here in the county, a pretty large wow. hospital that I'm going to do some spots for them. So fantastic, right? Yeah. Came directly through the chamber, but uh, yeah, that's, that's our life. I mean, we're, we're homebodies. We love to stay home. And a lot of people say, well, you go out to eat or anything. Well, heck yeah. We go to waffle house every week. I thought everybody right. did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that's, you know, we're just simple people. Gotcha. So if you were to write a letter to yourself and then send it back in time to when, before you even knew what voiceover was and when you were first getting introduced to it, mm -hmm. what would you, what would you tell your past self? Dear Troy, it doesn't matter what it pays, do what you love. And I would give that advice to anybody. Don't, don't get painted into a position to where you have to work to make a living. And that really, I'm not going to say I never liked what I did. I was pretty good at it. It was logistics and purchasing, and I had a knack for it. I had a knack for building good teams and having good people around me to help me. But had I been able to do something like this from an early age and do it my entire life, I mean, these last two years, I've never been happier. Hmm. I make less money, sure. I think I'll get there to where I was. I think this next year I'll see that I'm making more than I made in my manufacturing job, but it's not just the money. It's the satisfaction being creative and to be locked into a job to where you, you can be creative to a point, but not like I can now, you know, I can piece together videos for people. I can help them write spots, you know, and, and I can bring life to their project and the creativity. It's just awesome. So, it, you know, just dear Troy, don't be stupid again. You know, uh, it didn't matter if it was a radio DJ job or mm -hmm. whatever. It would have segued to where I am now probably a lot quicker. And I would have had more interest in it quicker to learn about it, even though it was a different business back then. Yeah. Fantastic. Where, where can people find you and where can people find the VO Life podcast? Well, the VO Life podcast is uh, sold anywhere. Fine podcasts are sold, I think. We're on uh, pretty well everywhere. Spotify, Apple, Google, uh, pretty much anywhere. Uh, the VO Life group in Facebook, it's a private group, but feel free to, uh, to jump, jump in there and send in your, uh, uh, your I would like to join thing. And, and most people get in. Um, and as far as everything else, it's Troy Holden Voices, uh, whether it's Facebook, uh, TikTok, uh, website, everything, TroyHoldenVoices.com. Beautiful. Well, thanks for coming on, man. This has been great. Enjoyed it. Enjoyed it. Good to speak with you again. It was good seeing you in Atlanta. And uh, yeah, let's, let's keep rocking it. I really hope you enjoyed listening to how Troy found a company's inner need and turned it into a passion he molded into a dream career. If you'd like to hear Troy's demos and get to know him a little bit more, visit his website at TroyHoldenVoices.com. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to The Voice Over Coffee Shop. For more information on guests, 
new episodes, and more, be sure to visit www.vocoffeeshop.com.